Here's how we believe COVID-19 will impact the upcoming college football season. Next on Michigan Podcast. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. Looks deep for Anthony Clark. Waits for it, hit Clark. This is no time for that. In the pocket and a sack. Tim Jamison. Brady gets terrific. Throws it, get it, touchdown night again. Just before Brazil got it, and a leaping interception by Woodson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle, caught by Kohler at the five on his feet, touchdown Michigan! On his way, it's good! He's 5'7", 179 pounds, a junior at Michigan, but Jamie Morris packs a wallop, and he delivers for Bo Schembeck. And here's your first play, pressure coming, sack! It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Ron Robinson and Michigan. win it. We're going to win the championship again because we're going to play as a team. And when we play as a team and the old season is over, you and I know it's going to be Michigan again. Michigan. Go Blue, I'm Steve Dace. Welcome to this week's Michigan podcast. We'll have the 10-minute war with Ohio State fan and college football analyst Mark Rogers coming up a little bit later on in the program, plus your Twitter poll results, as well as this week's question of the week. But we begin with what we teased from the open. There is no doubt COVID-19 will have a major role to play in the college football season to come. And yes, I still believe there will be a college football season to come. I do not believe you're going to see college football bankrupt itself while every other American team sport is playing. But that doesn't mean it's going to look much like anything we're accustomed to. In fact, I think here are just a few in this list of five, just a few of the ways things may be different this year because of COVID-19. Let's begin with number five. I think the Big Ten will unveil a 10-game conference-only schedule for each team that completely scraps the schedules we originally had. I do not believe you're going to see the nine-game schedule plus one, for example. I think they're going to completely scrap it and try to come up with something that utilizes the least amount of travel for every team as absolutely possible. Now, when your conference stretches from the DMV in Piscataway, New Jersey, to Lincoln, Nebraska, it's difficult um, and that's just yeah, that's just east to west. When you go from Madison, Wisconsin, and Minneapolis. Uh, down to Champaign, Illinois, uh, and uh, Iowa City, Iowa, and you, now we're talking north-south. Either way, it becomes very difficult to minimize travel, probably to the extent that you would prefer. Nevertheless, I think you're going to see the league do this in ways that are probably beyond what we are anticipating. And I think you're going to look at an entirely revamped schedule when it's slated to be released. The early word is it could come as soon as later this week. The next way I think we're going to see COVID-19 impact the upcoming season is the season will start relatively on time, meaning Labor Day, thereabouts, maybe pushed back for a couple of weeks, but relatively on time. But during the season, I think you're going to see schools and conferences that aren't already doing so are going to end up putting their players in a version of the bubble currently being used successfully by pro sports, despite their current vows, particularly in the Big Ten, not to do that. And here's why I think you're going to see them do so. Uh, The NFL right now, or I'm sorry, Major League Baseball right now is testing about 18,000 people. That's players, staff, support staff, coaches, everybody. 
they're testing positive at a 0.1% clip. 0.1%. Since the NBA went into the bubble, uh, the most recent testing sample, zero positives. Same thing with Major League Soccer. And I think eventually... The idea of bringing all these kids back to campus and who knows where they're coming from, uh, I think you're going to see at some point all of these teams and conferences are going to put their college football players in some variation of the bubble, meaning online courses, things of that nature from the football offices, some form of bubble as best as they can to mimic the protocols that have proven to be successful at the professional sports level. The third prediction of how COVID-19 will impact the upcoming season. Back to the Big Ten's revamped 2020 schedule, I think the Michigan-Ohio State game is going to be played in the first four weeks of the season. And I wouldn't be shocked if it's the opening game of the year. I think every effort will be made to make sure this game gets in rather than risk putting it at the end of the year when you're even less certain of how things go once these players really start interacting with one another and falling all over each other. So I do believe for the first time, I think I want to say since like 1935, the Michigan-Ohio State game will not be the final game of the regular season for both teams. A fourth way. I predict we could very well see COVID-19 impact the upcoming season. Starting the season will be more difficult than keeping it going. If they start the season, they will finish it. The, the, the major battle, politically, public relations-wise, and then, frankly, the just you know when you get out of the, that realm, the real public health concerns. Starting the year will be more difficult than finishing it. I, I, I believe once they start the season, They'll have the protocols and everything in place, um, the, the, the resources at stake here. There was a study published earlier this week. Each Power Five conference school could lose, each school, each school could lose up to $60 million by not playing this fall. And when you look at over 200,000 scholarships are on the line and probably gone if you don't play football this fall, I mean, folks, we're talking about a virus right now that if you are under the age of 70 in America, the mortality rate is 0.04% under the age of 70. And, and, and you go further, you get under 50, you get under 40. You look at the health of the issue of the age of these young men, not to mention the, the, the premier healthcare, preventative care that they're going to be getting, going to be getting the entire time. Um, I, I mean, there's a reason why, despite the fact up to 35, 40,000 Americans die from auto accidents every year, we don't ban cars. There's a reason why, despite concerns over carbon emissions, we don't ban cars because their overall usefulness to the other needs of society far outweigh their detriment. And the same thing goes here, too. So I think there'll be a much bigger battle over getting the season started. And once they do, I do then believe they will finish it. And then the final way that I think we'll see COVID-19 impact the 2020 season is I think we'll see an ending look very similar to what we're used to seeing. The two division winners will still play for the Big Ten Championship in Indianapolis after the regular season like they do every other year. I think we're going to see a lot of, 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 of hiccups, a, a lot of inconsistencies, a lot of newness, things we're not used to seeing in a college football season until we get to the very end. And then I think it will look very traditional to what we are accustomed to. We can let us know what you think about those five predictions in the comment section here on YouTube or wherever you podcast from. Uh, we'll find out, though, in our 10-minute war next, what Mark Rogers from uh, from the Ohio State side of things and also uh, with a larger view on college football. We'll see what he thinks here in a moment. Want to thank all of you who have been supporting us on Patreon these last few years here on Michigan Podcast. And for those of you that ask us every now and then, hey, what can we do to help uh, support what you guys are doing and help it to grow? Well, supporting us on Patreon is a big way you can do that. Patreon.com slash Michigan Podcast. And as you can see, 
when you become a $5 a month uh, subscriber and supporter or more, you get uh, as well exclusive content that we publish just for you on our Patreon page, including a lot of the stuff that I do with sports handicapping as legalization goes wider throughout the country. In fact, you can see uh, I put up just a couple of weeks ago uh, the notes uh, for NFL win totals, looking at the schedule release. So a lot more where that came from. If you want to support us at patreon.com slash Michigan podcast. That time again for the 10 minute war with our good friend, the voice of college football and our scarlet and gray needle in the haystack. The one and only reasonable Buckeye fan, Mark Rogers. Good to have you back, brother. How are you? Well, I'm going to keep that title for the time being, but I'm sure I'm going to say something in the next few weeks that's going to make you waver on that uh, title at some point. We'll or, get there. or in the next 10 minutes, as the or case maybe may in be. The next 10 minutes. Indeed. All right. So I laid this out a few minutes ago. Now I want to get your take on it. Uh, I laid out five ways that I think we're going to see COVID-19 impact the upcoming college football season. And yes, I do believe we're going to have a season. I, I was looking at some of the comments from Urban Meyer and Kirk Herbstreit uh, yesterday. I, I, I think watching the testing protocols in these pro sports leagues, MLS has a 0% testing rate right now. It's the latest in, round of NBA tests in their bubble, zero. It was 0.1 in Major League Baseball. I know these college coaches are, or I'm sorry, the ADs are saying, well, they're students. We're not going to put them in a bubble. I think at a lot of these places, they're already in a bubble, frankly. Okay. Uh, and I think that you're going to see them actually put in a bubble because there's just too much at stake, scholarship opportunities and everything else for students, uh, hundreds of thousands of students across the country that watching these other sports able to do this, I have a hard time believing college football is just going to impose a self-imposed bankruptcy on, on what could be $60 million of lost revenue uh, for every Power 5 team. Let's, let's start there as like a preamble. What are your thoughts on that, Mark? Well, my thoughts are that uh, if we're going with the, the, the bubble that's being um, proposed and has been enacted and we're seeing it in play in the MLS and the NBA, it doesn't seem functional or likely uh, to the And it's not likely and it's not going to happen to that degree where everybody convenes on Indianapolis, uh, 14 schools for that long and uh, makes it from the last week of August all the way to the first week of December because they are student first, athlete second, regardless of maybe their individual aspirations. So that can't happen. But like you say, uh, to, to pretend, especially at major football programs, that they are part of the student population in the way they conduct themselves and in the way they um, their, their social circles and so forth is not the case now. Uh, so they do operate in bubbles, and I just think they're going to take their regiment and probably already have to a certain extent of when they go on the road and move it to campus and just live a in a community of sorts as, as a football team to, to safeguard against uh, positive tests. So let's look at, here are five ways, and, and I could come up with many more, but I, for the brevity of time, I decided to narrow it down to five ways that I think we're going to see COVID-19 impact the upcoming college football season. I'm going to unveil these and one by one and let you respond and react. You ready to go? Oh, yeah. All right, here's number five. I think the, later this week, as soon as later this week, the Big Ten's going to unveil a 10-game conference-only schedule for each team as it promised. But I think it's going to completely scrap the schedules we've already had. I do not believe it's going to be the nine games every team was already going to play and then just plus one from there. I think they're going to try to come up with as many clever ways and maybe it won't be quite what the ACC is doing with this regional potting system and stuff like that. But I think they're going to try to cut down on as many travel uh, issues as they possibly can. So I think you're looking at an entirely different 10 game schedule. Your thoughts on that? Well, I originally thought, OK, they've already got a nine game season. All they have to do is tack on an attractive or whatever the goal is, tack on another game for each team. Uh, but like you, I think they are going to completely scrap it. All my sources uh, that I have in Big Ten Circle say that the, it's going to be a completely different schedule. Obviously, we're going to prioritize and uh, keep in check the division format and the division games. Uh, my thought process in involving any conference scheduling is fair and balanced scheduling, meaning every year when the, the Big Ten schedule is unveiled, I'm looking at East and West and I'm looking at all the various teams and who do you play in the other division? 
And I would like to see a balanced composite record from those teams come close to a 500 record from the previous season, but that never comes into play. And so you see teams, let's say in the Eastern Division, play three teams from the West that went 9-27 and 27 the previous season in the Big Ten, and other teams having to play three teams that went 27-9 and nine the previous season. Uh, that That's my approach to the scheduling, and I would like to see fair and balanced scheduling to produce a truer schedule to produce a champion. Um, it's a wild card year. Uh, those initiatives and those priorities have to be thrown out the door. Let's have a functional schedule, and I think actually that's going to be the priority is the functionality of the schedule and trying to build in as much flexibility as possible and not being so locked into uh, the, the even the travel. I think that's going to be a priority, but I think the functionality and providing and building in as much flexibility is going to be the priority there. I would like to see the home-and-home home concept come into play here where we play the old Oak and Bucky game between Indiana and Purdue, and then we've got two six-team divisions where we can square off the one-on-one -on -one matchups of Illinois Northwestern, Ohio State, Michigan, and on down the line and play a home-and-home -home series. Or you can go, are we going to go the level of uh, best attractive games that are going to bring attraction to the conference and also uh, fill up the coffers that have been drained by these non-conference games being um, canceled? All right. The next way I think we could see COVID-19 impact the 2020 college football season is I think the season is going to start relatively on time, meaning I think we could see the season maybe start a week earlier in late August, taking advantage of as much warm weather as we can. I think you could see it delayed for a few weeks, like what they're doing with 6A and 5A Texas high school football, just to give them another few weeks to make sure their protocols are in place. But I think overall, it'll start relatively on time. But as we've already discussed, I think during the season, schools and conferences that aren't already doing so are going to put their players in a version of the bubble currently being successfully used by pro sports, despite the current vows not to do that. That doesn't mean they align together in some centralized location but at most of these schools particularly this the further south of the big 10 you go mark if you know what i'm saying okay these guys really aren't a part of the student body they largely live at the football building they take online classes when they take classes all right uh and, and so i think you're going to see pretty much everybody that plays college football this fall adopt this kind of a model because even the schools that are open you're going to see a lot of distance learning on campus. You're going to see certain days where, hey, you you can attend classes, mask up, attend classes on a couple days a week. The other three days, you're in your dorm room, you're at your apartment, wherever you're at on campus doing distance learning, right? You're going to see all these mitigation policies implemented by these schools that open up their campuses anyway. And I think these football programs are going to say, well, if, if we're doing that anyway, and it's not already, it's already not the normal on-campus experience, then you know, why don't we just continue with the momentum we have coming out of camp that's going on right now. And, and Friday is when you can open up working with the coaches right across the country. Why not just continue those protocols and momentum right now that are keeping all these test rates low and we'll just ride this thing through the whole season. I think you're going to see that. So I can't argue with most of that, uh, Steve. Uh, I do think that uh, much of that is going to be the strong suggestion, like the voluntary workouts yeah. is going to be these are the guidelines that we put in play. And, and maybe a lot of that is going to be kept as much as possibly can be kept uh, from the public uh, to consume those rules and regulations or the, that uh, strong suggestion of the way we're going to conduct ourselves through the football season, but this is the way we're going to do it, and everybody needs to, to come along with the way this is going to be conducted for us to have a football team that's going to stay healthy and do all the right things and play games on the field. But uh, I, don't, I don't know how much we're going to be privy to those rules and regulations. And frankly, how much we need to be, by the way, right? Sure. that's kind of one of those things we get privy to them if they don't work then suddenly we're all really privy to them if you know what i'm saying <laughs> all right um let's go to my next way i think we could see COVID 19 impact uh the 2020 college football season I, let's go back to the big tens revamp 2020 schedule i think the michigan ohio state game is going to be played in the first four weeks of the season and i wouldn't be shocked if it's the opening game of the season mark so this is where i'd like to go back to my home and home concept for the rivalry games because we want to see the game played, or maybe you and some of your Michigan fans don't want to see the game played. I, I'd be fine but, if it's not played. I'm on record as saying that. I, yeah. I've heard that from you a few times. <laughs> uh, but the rest of us want to see the game intact and played. Well, my home-and-home home concept kind of preserves that, or at least protects it as much as you possibly can, 
uh, if you schedule one of the two games in September and then keep the traditional matchup sometime in late November, maybe you give it a bit of a buffer in the scheduling process to to be able to play it a week later or a week earlier if needed, but give it that that buffer in November to keep it at, uh, at a traditional place as much as possible. The Big Ten, I think, more than any other Power Five conference is tied to, to tradition and, and tries to, to hold on to traditions as much as possible. And many of them, I, I think, are meaningful and some of them are a bit silly. Uh, but they do break down and they have been breaking down throughout the years. And I think uh, the Friday night scheduling of games has been maybe one of the latest uh, that the Big Ten has conceded to the TV schedule. Uh, but I would like to see this game played twice. Therefore, if you have an issue in late November and the traditional matchup can't be played, you already have a game in the bank in like September. That idea too. Yeah. Or vice versa. Or if they both get played, hey, we're sitting here in 15 to 20 years from now, looking back on 2020 and what a horrible year it was, except we had a home and home -home Ohio State Michigan series for the first time, probably the last time ever. See, I kind of think overall, brother, we should. I love what the NFL drafted. It embraced the abnormality. It embraced the uniqueness. It gave you perspectives and things you've never been able to see before. Uh, I, I think it would be wise to do that with this. The Major League Baseball is doing it. No DH in the National League, stuff like that. Okay, let's let's go ahead and embrace it. Let's own it, and 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 that way you're right. 10, 15, 20 years from now, we look back on this time and remember it as you know what you know. I kind of have some fond memories. I don't want to go through that ever again. But I, you know, I, there were some interesting, unique experiences. We tried some stuff that we would normally not try before. I like the home and home idea. By the way, I would. I know this sounds nuts. I'd actually rather play Ohio State twice than once. I'd rather I, if it was up to me, we either play them, don't don't play them at all, uh, or or do a home and home, something different, something unique, um, and and something that makes us feel like, you know what, the season's not just difficult, but it's special at the exact same time, right? That's kind of what I hear you saying. I'm with you, all definitely. Right. The fourth way that I think we could see coronavirus change what we're used to in college football this year, uh, I think that starting the season is going to be more difficult than keeping it going. I think if they start the season, they will finish it. I think we've seen this pattern in Major League Baseball where about a week into spring training, it didn't look like there was any way they're going to make it. I mean, you've got arguably the best player in the game talking about, you know, my wife's pregnant, i got to wear a mask, I'm not sure it's safe to play. David Price and a few other guys are sitting out. You know, are, are we even going to make it here? Are we going to get it, get through it? Um, the same thing with the NBA players. Hey, you know, this is like we're staying at a Red Roof Inn. Look at this terrible food. And guys are opting out because of injuries and aren't going to play. NFL had this issue with the hashtag earlier this week with the players, and I agree with the players personally, which is there's no point, first of all, why play preseason games are stupid anyway, but but secondly, college football doesn't have pre-se- any preseason games, and we do it just fine, right? But, but secondly, this year, why have games that don't count risking infection from a bunch of players who won't even be on your rosters. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever, right? And so the players you saw uh, with training camp scheduled to start in the, a week a week from now in the NFL, hey, you know, with their hashtag, we, we don't like your testing protocols. It seems to me the pattern is that getting going is, the, is where the controversy is because it's new, you're blazing a trail, that's where all the worries and everything are. And then once you actually get into the process of managing this, uh, and and your protocols that that seems to be like we there was all this controversy at the start of spring training and then like the whole rest of spring training went by in five minutes and you're like oh crap the season starts in two days right and that seems to be the pattern here and I think that will be the pattern with college football the debate will be what is the starting date and then once the debate once the starting date begins I think then the season will finish from there. So if I'm reading you and I'm reading what I think the situation should be to play out, I am no medical expert, so I I don't have a strong pushback on this in any way. And if anything, I agree with it because why not have the flexibility built within the season? So I would, if anything, start the season as soon as possible, maybe a week zero, August 29th start. As would I. Then you incorporate more flexibility within the calendar. Well, first of all, I think that's when the season should start anyway, any year. So every team gets two bye weeks 
That helps with the health of the body. That helps with academics. You also have, how about having some weeks where these group of five programs and stuff like that take center stage? And and, and every, there's just so much more flexibility if you start the season in that week zero, that last week of August, when most of high, these guys are used to starting seasons then anyway. That's when high school football starts. I, I've always been in favor of that anyway, Mark. Get the season going. And if we need to adjust, we'll have more time to adjust. Seems reasonable to me. The The initial push was, well, the season's going to get pushed back. We need to push it back because the testing is going to be so much better and the results of the tests are going to be so much better. Well, as we see this play out, that's not necessarily the case. And there's a lot of skewing of the numbers and we could get into that. But um, the, the numbers aren't necessarily, again, I think the situation's getting better. Not necessarily the numbers are reflecting that. So if we're waiting for the numbers to get better by pushing back a season one, or two weeks, that's not going to happen. Final way I, I'm predicting COVID-19 is going to impact the season is I think this is where we're going to end it in ways we're used to. I think you're still at the end of the year going to see the two division winners play for the Big Ten title in Indianapolis after the regular season. I still think it's going to end. It, it, I think it's going to look a lot different leading up to it and during it than we've ever seen before, or at least since World War II when you had guys coming and going for the military and teams like Iowa pre-flight, number one in the country and stuff like that, and and almost nobody watching right now was alive back then or remembers what that was like. So I think before and during, it's going to look a lot different than what we're accustomed to, but then I think at the end, it's going to end in ways we're, we're, we're traditionally used to. Your logic is pretty strong there, Steve, for a Michigan guy. Uh, because <laughs> when you really look at it, I, there would have to be a catastrophic situation in one of the two divisions to create a situation which I would think you would need to tear it up. Uh, because even if two teams were eliminated out of one division, I still, depending, uh, to be reasonable about it, depending on which programs we're talking about, uh, but if we're just looking at the math, I still think it's a division format in which you play the two champions Um Regardless, I, I can't see anything playing out. And if it gets to that point, we probably have bigger issues mm -hmm. involving just getting teams on the field to play meaningful games that can determine a champion in any way um, than, than playing the format in which um, we originally have it. Yeah, I, I, I completely see that. That um, Yeah, I think you outlined it perfectly in regards to it could be looking so much different through the course of the season, but the result should be Indianapolis, two teams that represent the East and the West playing for a championship. That all being said, though, and if they wanted to use this year as the excuse to do it, I'm all for it as well. I think you eliminate divisions. I, I'm a big proponent of it. I love what the Big 12 does, which is commissioned by a longtime former Big Ten athletic director, by the way, Bob Bowlesby. Just take the top two teams, come up with as much of a balanced schedule as you can and try instead of trying to competitively and geographically, um, you know, uh, position divisions, just, you know, you have some rivalries that are protected. You mentioned the old Oaken bucket, the, you know, uh, the ax, uh, you know, between Minnesota, Wisconsin, the game, of course, you have some of those. And then after that, it's just at the end of the year, the top two teams go to Indianapolis to play for the championship. I'd get rid of the divisions. So for me, Steve, the Big 12 does it right because it's the purest championship because everybody played right. everyone, but they fell into that conclusion. That yeah. wasn't their brainchild. Uh, they had, of course, um, schools leave the, the conference and then they fell into that scenario. So, Mark, before we let you go, is there anything else you have heard through the grapevine and through your sources or talking to other college football reporters on your YouTube channel? over the last few days that we didn't bring up or, or talk about as it relates to the season and COVID-19 that you think we ought to discuss here? I would like to say that there is, just to bring some value to your show here, Steve. But uh, I just got off the line with a, a reporter from Bucknuts, 247 Sports. They pretty much lined it up the way we're discussing it right here uh, of all the possibilities, but the probabilities that uh, they're going to tear it up and that the functionality of the schedule and the flexibility is going to rule this according to the way they see it. Define functionality. Functionality meaning that in this instance, if when you I mean. eliminate team A, that you can see, okay, well, then we can adjust accordingly mm -hmm. 
this way, this way, or that way. Okay, let's eliminate Team B. What are we going to do? Right. Let's eliminate this week and that week. How many different openings and opportunities have we provided ourselves to fall back on? Always great stuff, Mark. Thanks for joining us here again in the 10-Minute War. We'll see you next time. All right, take care. Thanks a lot, Steve. This week's Twitter poll results, we asked, would you prefer the 2020 conference-only schedule included 10 different opponents or home-and-homes against divisional foes? 76% of you said you'd prefer 10 different opponents. I, I was originally surprised when I saw the wide margin that that answer won by until I considered that I'm asking Michigan fans, do you want to play Ohio State twice? <laughs> And now that you look at it that way, hey, man, the only thing worse than getting your perennial beat down by the Buckeyes is suffering that ignominious defeat twice in one year. So now those numbers begin to make a little bit more sense. This week's question of the week comes from MSU Dog, who says, aren't you just a bitter scum? And I love that, by the way. Aren't you just a bitter scum fan because MSU had the cash to back up the Brinks truck and sign Mel Tucker. Brother, here's what I can tell you from a Michigan fan perspective. Michigan fans would have backed up the maize and blue truck for Michigan State to sign Mel Tucker too. That'll do it for this week's episode here. Don't forget, like, rate, subscribe, five-star review, whether it's YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, however you access Michigan Podcast each and every week, please give us that positive feedback and help others to know, other Michigan fans to know, that we're here on the maize and blue wall for them. Thanks to all of you for tuning in. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter, at Michigan Podcast. Until the next time, go blue.